I begin with a disclaimer in that I claim no expertise to the study of religious identity. For almost too many decades now, I've dealt with two other group identities um, and loyalties, namely first, the nation and its counterpart nationalism, and second, citizenship, and of course its counterpart, patriotism. And since much of this talk will therefore revolve about the nation, I think that I had best preface my remarks with a few words on my use of terms, nation and nationalism. <clears throat> because although often so used, a nation is not a proper synonym for either a state or for the entire population of a state without regard to its ethnic composition. In its original pristine sense, a nation refers to a group of people who believe, I emphasize that, who believe <clears throat> that they are ancestrally related. It is the largest group that can be aroused, stimulated to action by appeals to common ancestors and to a blood bond. And so an American nation, whether used in reference to the United States or to its citizens, is really a misnomer. Nationalism, as properly used, does not connote loyalty to the state. That loyalty is properly termed patriotism, or if you prefer, civic identity and civic loyalty. Nationalism should connote loyalty to one's nation, one's extended family. And so one can therefore accurately speak of an English or a Welsh nationalism, but not of a British one, the latter being a case of patriotism. Now, none of this, I feel, is semantic nitpicking, for I think it's essential that the vital difference between these two loyalties never be blurred. When the two loyalties are perceived as being in irreconcilable conflict, <clears throat> now they need not be so perceived, but when they are, nationalism, that is to say, again, loyalty to one's group, customarily has proven to be the more powerful. Nationalism proved to be the single most potent source of global instability over the last two centuries. <clears throat> As you all know, it heavily contributed to the dissolution of the Ottoman, Austro-Hungarian, British, Belgian, Dutch, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and Russian empires. During the past century, the number of independent states more than quadrupled, and ethno-national demands that the principle of national self-determination be yet further extended are currently growing rather than decreasing. Conflicts involving loyalty to state, again patriotism, and loyalty to the national group, nationalism, speckle the globe from Tibet to Kashmir to Kurdistan to Chechnya to the Ivory Coast to Kosovo to Abkhazia to the Basque Country to the Shan State to Djibouti to Chiapas to Quebec. So nationalism therefore has been and remains, of course, a powerful force for political upheaval. But towards the end of the last century, a broad-scale religious revival sent additional shockwaves through the global system. It was not that religion had been rediscovered. It had seemingly never been lost. Back in 1993, a Gallup poll covering 19 highly diverse countries found that agnostics and atheists combined varied from less than 1% of the population, India, Ireland, and Turkey, to a high of 10% in Uruguay. In between there were such countries as the United States, the United Kingdom, and Bolivia, where non-believers accounted for 4%, South Korea and Portugal, 3%, and Nigeria, Canada, and Finland, 2%. Now notice that the sample included countries of Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, and Islamic traditions. So it's not religiousness, therefore, which is a new development. What is now noticeable, that was not so noticeable prior to the 1970s, is a growing pressure, particularly but definitely not solely within the Islamic world, to replace secular-minded governments with more religiously committed ones. And there is increasing pressure to have public policy reflect religious values and traditions. Now, there's been a tendency, as I'm sure you're all aware, to view these two trends, the religious and the national, as antithetical 
and to perceive religious identity as proving more powerful than national identity. An ethnic transcending loyalty is inherent in such expressions as the Islamic or the Islamist threat, or in the malapropism Hindu nationalism, or in references to the clash of civilizations. It was this common reinterpretation of recent events that led me as a student of nationalism to become more seriously involved with religious identity. But my own research suggests that this perception of the two trends as opposed and weighted in favor of religion is overdrawn. It suggests that the religious revival has operated primarily, not totally, but primarily within the confines of national groups, and that even so-called universal religions, such as Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, and Islam, in practice appear to reinforce the specific national identities under their umbrella. Consider the Islamist threat. Almost certainly victories for revivalist movements in the Islamic world are likely to exert a particularly pervasive impact upon their societies. Governmental impl implementation of Islamic dress codes, greater isolation of women, Islamic law, the Sharia, as the basis for civil law, all these may well follow as they did in Iran following Ayatollah Omani's ascension to power and as they did in those regions of Afghanistan where the Taliban faction was victorious. So the potential implication of Islamic revival for individual societies should certainly not be ignored or downplayed. <clears throat> but it should not be assumed, I think, that Islamic revivalism indicates that religious identity is proving more powerful than ethno-national identity. Admittedly, Islamic tenets do hold that religious identity should be the stronger. <clears throat> Islam holds that the most important division of humanity is that between the community of believers, the Ummah, and on the other hand, all non-believers. However, at least since the World War I uprising of some of the Arabs against the Islamic empire of the Ottoman Turks, ethno-national identity has increasingly struck me as proving more powerful than a, than a common Islamic identity. What follows are just a few examples. The Islamic Republic of Pakistan was created in 1947 expressly on the assumption that religious identity was the paramount one. But national identity is subsequently proven more powerful within Pakistan. The Bengalis of what was East Pakistan were very good Muslims indeed, but perceived no need to be ruled by Punjabis just because Punjabis were also Muslim. And so the separate state of Bangladesh was formed. Today, Sindhis and Baluchis also resent rule by the political leadership in Islamabad despite a shared religion. A second illustration involves the Islamic belt across the former Soviet Union. As Ray here can testify, during the existence of that state, we were told repeatedly by several scholars that these people had a pan-Islamic identity that was more powerful than any individual national identity. But the violence that erupted across the Soviet Union beginning in 1989 was at least as much between Islamic national groups, Uzbeks, Tajiks, Kyrgyz, etc., as between Muslims and non-Muslim peoples. Attacks against settler communities and Muslim peoples within one or another homeland continue to this day. A pan-Islamic drive to merge Kazakhstan, Uyghurstan, Tajikistan, etc., is not visible. The Iran-Iraq war during the 1980s also points to the power of national over a common religious identity. Ayatollah Romani, who had come into power in 1979, had of course been trying to export his Islamic revolution throughout the entire Islamic world, but with little success, to impart to the fact, of course, that the Persians are Shiite, and as we now know, are therefore anathema to Sunnis, who account for more than 80% of all Muslims worldwide. 
But Iraq, as we all also now know, is more than 60% Shiites. Shiite, and Shiites are a particularly disproportionate majority in the South. Hamana's propaganda, as beamed into Iraq, was propounded in religious terms. Something, if you will, of a paraphrase of Karl Marx. Muslims of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but Hussein's. <laughs> to, to, to counter this, Saddam Hussein played down religion, couching his message to his people in ethno-national terms. This is a war of the Arabs versus the detestable Persians. We are fighting in this struggle for the Arab nation. We are its vanguard. Iraqi Shiites and Sunnis have a long history of tense relations, and we're all aware of the carnage being committed between them today. But in the 1970s, nonetheless, Saddam's ploy of describing the struggle as Arab versus Persian apparently worked remarkably well, for no substantial support for Iran became visible. Had large support for Iran surfaced, Iran would presumably have been victorious, for some two-thirds of the Iraqi army's non-officers at the time were Shiites. Moreover, <clears throat> unlike its external propaganda, the internal propaganda within Iran was throughout the war nationalistic in content. Repetitive peons to the nation far outnumbered references to an Islamic cause. <clears throat> Not atypical is the following next track from the 1987 New Year's message of Iran's president. The past year was full of adventures for our nation and country. It should be emphasized, of course, that it was also a year of victory and glory for our nation. Despite the numerous problems created by the enemies of the revolution and the nation during the past year, our nation, with special heroism and great faith, was able to overcome all difficulties. A few weeks earlier, on the occasion of the eighth anniversary of the Islamic Revolution, the president had referred to Ayahuwah Khamani as the beloved guide of our nation. And on the same day, the Ayatollah released a message addressed, quote, to the great nation of Iran, the beloved Iranian nation. Yet another case is offered by Malaysia in one of the most interesting studies dealing with the Islamic revival, Professor Judith Nagata of Canada's York University examined the recent rise of Islamic related behavior on the part of Malay Muslims. As elsewhere, the revival has been reflected in much greater attendance at service in the mosque, the adoption of the traditional Islamic shrine head covering, the chur, even on the part of some of the most urban, well-educated young women, and demands that the law and public policy reflect Islamic values and traditions. In addition, the revivalists have demanded much greater preferential treatment in economic and social matters. However, Professor Nagata found that the main ways use their newly reinvigorated religiousness not just to demand preferential status for themselves against the non-Muslim Chinese, but against a series of other non-Malay, but Islamic peoples living within the country. In short, Islamic revivalism was placed in the service of Malay nationalism. As she concludes, within the boundaries of the Malaysian state, it is apparent that ethnic loyalties take precedence over those created by membership in Yuma. Now, I earlier made reference to the Islamic Taliban movement within Afghanistan. In its struggle for dominance, it became clear, and it's still clear today, that its support came overwhelmingly from the ethnically Pashtun people of southern Afghanistan, and that it was, as it continues to be, stoutly resisted by the Uzbeks and Tajiks of northern Afghanistan, despite the fact that they like the Pushtuns, are overwhelmingly Sunni Muslims. As a last example of a challenge to the myth of an overriding Islamic identity, consider Algeria within the Islamic revival movement. 
There, the movement has clearly appealed to large numbers of the country's Arab population, but definitely not to the Berber minority, who are also Muslim. Now, with all this as background, I'd like to say just a few words about the Islamic revival as it has evolved in the Arab world. As you are probably aware, many writers have described the revival as marking the end of Arab nationalism. But there is evidence that the turn to religion on the part of many has been an attempt to invigorate Arab consciousness and will. The revival among young Arabs began in the wake of Israel's truly embarrassingly easy <coughs> victory in the 1967 war. That is to say, long before Hamani's revolution could offer inspiration. In the search for an explanation for Arab weakness, secular nationalism borrowed from the West and destitute of Arab tradition was viewed as having failed to sink roots among the Arab people. Progressive as well as conservative Arabs insisted that Arabs must return to their traditional culture and roots, which meant of necessity Islamic culture and inspiration. In one of the broadest based polls covering Arab opinion, a poll directed in 1992 by one of our common speakers, Sayyid Ibn Ibrahim of Egypt, to which 1,500 intellectuals from nine Arab countries responded. Notice that it's just intellectuals now, but nonetheless, an amazing 98% of respondents indicated that they wished that all of the Arab countries would unite although only 68% felt that this could ever be achieved. More significantly to the question, do you think that religious fundamentalism, not just revival, but religious fundamentalism, do you think that religious fundamentalism is an obstacle to the realization of Arab unity? 83.5% replied no. A number of more regionally based polls indicate that a state which is both Arab and Islamic, is the preferred model. In short, Arab nationalism and Islam have been viewed, at least by many Arabs, as constituting an in tandem relationship. Now, I think it should not be forgotten, because I, I find this is true, this assumption that uh, the proof of religious revival has to defeat the other. I think it should not be forgotten. There is no inherent incompatibility between religious and ethno-national identity. Religion and nation are only two of the many potential group identities simultaneously partaken in, partaken in of, by, by the individual. <coughs> Family, locale, state citizenship, age cohort, gender, profession, peer and social organizations, these are only a few of the other usually harmonious potentialities. Only when two or more group identities are perceived as in conflict, when one feels forced to choose among them, does the issue of the comparative strength of loyalties arise. As to religion and nation, the evidence, at least as I read it, is that most people seldom perceive a contradiction between these two particular identities. For most people, religion comes to be perceived as a reinforcer, an inherent part of national identity. As a consequence, national movements and individual nationalists can be either religious or secular in orientation, and they can swing periodically in either direction. This close association between religion and national identity is most evident, of course, where the religion is essentially restricted to a single people, for example, Judaism or Sikhism. But even in the case of so-called universal religions, again, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, the religion in practice has been particularized, or if you will, ethnicized or nationalized. Now, in noting this, I am not questioning the universal message of the theology of these faiths, but it does suggest to me that when you look closely at a universal religion 
as it is carried out in practice in one or another society. It has, to a remarkable degree, been reformulated to meet the local people's special traditions and conditions. Religions that are adopted are adapted. When such broadly diffused religions are examined comparatively from one society to another, what is striking to me is how, while preserving the veneer of a single universal religion, they have come to reflect the local people's identity and traditions. Thus transformed, religion comes to be perceived as a reinforcer, a constituent part of the national identity. The process of emphasizing the universal can even extend to combining two seemingly incompatible belief systems, including the wedding of monotheism and polytheism. As you know, Indonesia is regularly described as the most populist and populous Islamic state. But while the most basic tenet of Islam is that there is no God but Allah, polytheism carried over from a pre-Islamic Hindu tradition is broadly practiced among the majority of Muslims, those known as the Abagam. Similarly, within Cuba, a religion called Santeria flourishes which combines Christian Catholicism with Yoruba multi-deity beliefs, the Yoruba being a people found in Nigeria and Benin. The same coupling of Catholicism and polytheistic beliefs of African origin is present in a very popular and expanding religion in Brazil called Kendrigli. And despite the first commandment, idolatry, for example, muriolatry, has thrived throughout the history of Christianity. Similarly, throughout the Southeast Asian world of Theravada Buddhism, the sharp division between the temporal and spiritual worlds that is basic to Buddhist thought is obscured by popular beliefs in local gods and spirits who are supplicated for protection and assistance in the material world. Ethnicization of the universal I think is also evident in those situations where religious leaders condone and even encourage activities against the nation's enemies, which violate the most fundamental standards of faith, even to encouraging killing and atrocities. A medieval English friar, friar wrote that it is, quote, no sin to slay an Irishman. During the Napoleonic Wars, members of the Italian clergy accompanied the troops in the field, in combat, urging them to kill more Frenchmen. In the early 1940s, a Franciscan, a Franciscan preacher sermonized, Brother Croats, go and slaughter all Serbs. And first of all, slaughter my sister, who was married to a Serb, and then kill all the Serbs in a row. When you have finished, come to me, and I'll hear your confession and give you forgiveness for your sins. About the same time, another Franciscan told his Croatian parishioners, you are old women and you should put on skirts because you have not killed a single Serb. We have no weapons or knives and we must forge them out of scythes and sickles so that you can cut the throats of Serbs whenever you see them. One might expect members of the Sangha, the monks of Theravada Buddhism, to be the world's most immune people to nationalist extremism, given that religion's renunciation of the material world and its firm injunction to do no harm to any living thing. But there are numerous examples of monks encouraging the killing of ethnic enemies. A Sinhalese monk described the situation on Liba Sri Lanka's liberation from British colonial rule as follows. <clears throat> the religio patriotism at that time assumed such overpowering proportions that both bhikkhus, ordained monks, and laymen considered that even killing people in order to liberate the region and the country was not a heinous crime. Ethnicization of the universal is perhaps most flagrant in the appropriation of towering figures associated with the founding of the universal religion to serve a single nation's cause. The Sinhalese national legend holds that the Buddha 
visited Sri Lanka during his lifetime, drove out the inhabitants, and gave the island to the Sinhalese to protect as the fortress of pure Buddhist thought. To the Sinhalese, this saga establishes that they are the earliest extant settlers in the Holy Land, and that it prohibits any conciliatory grant of autonomy to the Tamils and others who share the island and indeed may have preceded them there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the patron saint of a number of societies. She is the officially designated queen of Croatia and of Poland. In the case of Mary, there has also been a tendency to perceive her in terms of a national legend. Poland's most celebrated icon is a painting of the Madonna, popularly called Our Lady of Jasnogora, which is said to possess miraculous powers and is believed to have saved Poland from invading Tatari and later Swedish forces. Some sense of the power of the legend can be gleaned from a 1984 letter from Pope John Paul II, who is of course a Polish background, to Poland's then Cardinal Wyszynski. In my mind's eye, I see myself kneeling by you before the image of the Madonna, the Lady of Jasnogora, which was given to us to defend our nation. And, and once again, I entrust you to her at this difficult and significant moment in the life of our homeland. The Mexican counterpart to Our Lady of Yasnacoa is the Virgin of Guadalupe. Following the Spanish conquest of Mexico, Catholic missionaries were experiencing strong resistance to conversion on the part of the indigenous people. The situation altered radically. Following, according to legend, the appearance of the Virgin in 1531, before a poor Indian peasant, Juan Diego, giving him instructions to inform the local Catholic hierarchy of her desire that a church be built on a site. Conveniently, the site was already the location of a shrine honoring perhaps the most famous Indian goddess named Tanatsu, or Our Mother. The apparition of the Virgin was said to have had brown skin and is always so depicted further adding to the ease of identification of the Virgin on the part of the indigenous people. Parenthetically, in 1960, 1996, one of the requests the spokesman for the indigenous people of next door Guatemala made to the government was to require that all images of the Virgin be subsequently attired in native Mayan dress. But in any case, the Virgin of Guadalupe became the patron saint of Mexico, and an important figure in national historiography. Popular Mexican history holds that the War of Independence began when a village priest urged his Indian parishioners to revolt with a cry, death to the Spaniards, long live the Virgin of Guadalupe. Nobel laureate Octavio Paz has written that the Virgin of Guadalupe, quote, is engraved in the heart of Mexico and it is impossible to understand our country and its history without understanding what the cult of Guadalupe has been and is. The saga of the Apostle James in Spain offers yet another illustration of the building of religion and nationalism. According to legend, in 899, at a time when Christian forces limited to northernmost Spain were desperately seeking the expulsion of Muslim Moors from the peninsula. The bones of the Apostle James were miraculously discovered at the site of the present city named after him, Santiago de Compostela. Inspired by his evidence of God's support, the rollback of the Moors, what the Spanish called the Reconquest, commenced. Today there are numerous statues of St. James throughout Spain one of which, located in Santiago de Compostela, depicts him astride a horse, smearing one person while his horse tramples another. Interestingly, the inscription reads, Santiago Matamoros, St. James, the Moor killer, rather than the Muslim killer. But in any case, at least to me, the linking of symbols of nonviolence, such as the Buddha, Mary, and James, 
or the shedding of blood in the nation's cause, highlights the degree to which ostensibly universal faith can become nationalized in practice. Within Christendom, the tendency to indigenize universal religions is perhaps most clearly manifested in the selection of saints. After all, who but the Irish revere St. Patrick? Typically, the patron saint is one who figures in the national legend. To the Romanians, it is St. Stephen, also known as Stephen the Great, who it is alleged defeated the Turks 49 times and built a monastery after each victory. For the Magyars, the patron saint is Isfahan, the most famous king in Hungarian history, who extended the Hungarian Empire and whose crown, a major symbol of Hungarian nationalism, was a few years ago placed with much fanfare in the parliament in Budapest. The Serbian patron saint Simeon was a tribal leader who, like hungry Saint Istvan, fought surrounding enemies and created the first Serbian state. The Serbs incidentally had 60 saints, all of them are Serbian. Even at the level of formal organization, universal religions have not hesitated to identify themselves with specific peoples. Within Christianity, many peoples have their own church. In Northwestern Europe, the Greek of Rome led to the Anglican Church, the Church of England, the Dutch Reformed Church, the Church of Sweden, Church of Scotland, Danish Lutheran Church, etc. Even within the ostensibly hierarchical Catholic Church, the same ethnicization has occurred. And so terms such as Irish Catholicism and Polish Catholicism are certainly not devoid of meaning. For example, the Polish bishops refer to themselves collectively not as defenders of a universal faith, but as, quote, the shepherds and sons of the Polish nation. The Armenians, of course, have had their own autonomous church for a millennium and a half. Within Christian orthodoxy, such churches became the rule. The Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian, Russian Orthodox Church, the Serbian Orthodox Church, etc. And just as in the case of saints in Christianity, getting one's own church within orthodoxy is very much a political uh, issue uh, when it is attempted. The tendency of such churches to define their mission in terms of their own people rather than in universal terms is evident in the following open letter from 21 priests and monks from around Serbia. The church, which is woven organically into the historical and spiritual existence of his people before Kosovo, during Kosovo, and after Kosovo, right up to the present day, onto whose living flesh every blow intended for the Serbian people falls first. Can its destiny and the destiny of its people be resolved without it? So religion and nationalism, therefore, often intertwine. And because they do intertwine, Students of conflict must be on guard that a conflict described by the outsider simply as a religious struggle does not have an important and perhaps even a paramount national dimension. For example, the perhaps the most well-known case in the West, the protracted struggle in Northern Ireland, although often described as a religious issue, is certainly better understood as a competition between those who consider themselves ethnically Irish and those who do not. The non-Irish are mostly descendants of 17th century settlers from the realm Scotland. In the late 19th century, Joseph Chamberlain, in his resistance to home rule for the entire island of Ireland, made much of this ethnic division by urging the people of lowland Scotland to stick by their kin. He reminded them that the people of this Ulster were, quote, born of your bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh, and that blood is thicker than water. Note the absence of a reference to the common Presbyterian religion. The relative unimportance of religion to the conflict was manifest in a poll conducted in 1990. As to this, what they perceived as the causes of the conflict, only 13% of those described as Protestants 
and 12% of those described as Catholic listed religion as a factor. A somewhat similar case within Egypt is regularly pops up in the news. One of the many periodic outbreaks involving the Coptic minority will usually be described solely as a conflict between Muslims and the Coptic Christians. But religious preference in what is termed the Arab world is often an indicator of national identity. Within Egypt, two major identities have long competed. The concept of Egyptian, with roots going back to Pharaonic times, and the concept of being part of the Arab nation. The Coptic Church was prominent within Egypt long before Islam was brought by Arabs from the Arabian Peninsula, and the word Copt literally means Egyptian. The Coptic religion, to both its members and its enemies, is therefore a symbol of a pre-Islamic, to be sure, but also a pre-Arabic identity. Again, I offer these two examples only to suggest that a research agenda aimed at evaluating the influence of the two identities must be alert to possible ethnic dimensions in what superficially appear to be a purely religious conflict. But given the fact that religious and national identities do intertwine, can they ever be sufficiently separated so as to permit an assessment of the relative strength of the two loyalties? They won't be the same among all people. They won't be the same over time. But I do believe that in some cases, they can be separated enough for some sort of an evaluation. As earlier noted, people usually perceive no incompatibility between the two. But I think there are situations where the two sometimes clash, but at least become distinguishable. In line with the focus of this talk, there is only to question the tendency to perceive the religious revival as establishing the paramountcy of religious identity over national identity. I shall concentrate on situations which suggest the primacy of ethnic or national identity. An interesting case, this one runs through time, that of the small proselytizing religions. Those not actively interested in attracting large numbers of new members. Those without a universal religion. Such faith, Judaism and Sikhism among them, because of subsequent inbreeding, over time give rise to the creation of a nation, a group who believe they are ancestrally related. Following the establishment of such a nation, individuals over time may become agnostics, atheists, even converts, while retaining a strong sense of a unique national consciousness. That is to say, religion can give rise to national identity, but the latter can subsequently become totally independent of the former for its sustenance. Situations, secondly, in which religious leaders take positions popularly viewed as not sufficiently supportive of the nationalist cause. Religious leaders have often very successfully ridden the nationalist tiger. Current or recent examples would include both the Catholic Orthodoxy clergy, both the Catholic and Orthodoxy clergy throughout the Balkans, Sinhalese Buddhist monks within Sri Lanka, Hudu clergy within Rwanda, the patriarch and hierarchy of the Russian Orthodox Church, the clergy of the Methodist Church in Fiji. On the other hand, religious leaders have a very poor record of success when they oppose nationalism. Examples of the latter might include the assassinated Tutsi Archbishop Aru of Burundi, who shortly before his assassination was reviled at a funeral for Tutsi victims of a massacre for suggesting that there are good and bad to be found among both Tutsis and Hutus. Or the Dalai Lama, who because of his persistent opposition to violent resistance to Chinese rule, is reportedly perceived increasingly as irrelevant by militants within Tibet. Or the former Cardinal of Ireland, Daly, who publicly acknowledged his own unpopularity within the Irish Catholic community of Northern Ireland because of his greater attack on all nationally inspired violence. The Cardinal recalled 
how his utterances have provoked, quote, a great deal of what you call hate mail, especially from those who regarded me as betraying our own people. A vivid vignette involving the relative influence of religion and national identity was offered a few years ago by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. The head of the church, the patriarch, had traditionally been a member of the politically dominant Amhara uh, people. But when a liberation front composed of members of the Tigrayan nation toppled the government, they replaced the patriarch with a Tigrayan. Shortly thereafter, the new patriarch went to the United States to bring his blessings to the now rather substantial members of his church who have settled here. At his very first, and as it turned out, last public appearance, he was literally pelted by stones and eggs thrown by those of our new background. In assessing the power of religion versus nation, I would also suggest a study of the behavior of clergy during periods when the nation's cause and the policy of ecclesiastical superiors are at odds. For example, during the 19th and early 20th centuries, the popes, by and large, were totally opposed to Irish nationalist aspirations, while in Ireland most village priests and even some bishops supported it. Similarly, during the 1930s civil war in Spain, the vast clergy thoroughly supported, indeed, not only supported, but participated in the Basque national movement in opposition to the wishes of the Catholic hierarchy in Madrid. The latter, of course, were overwhelmingly drawn from the dominant Castilian nation. I would also suggest studying the relationship between nationalism and fluctuation in attendance at religious services. Authoritarian governments intent on suppressing manifestations of nationalism among a minority people, often charge that religious activities are but a thinly veiled substitute. The Soviet government regularly reveled such charges. <laughs> he did. Oh, well. I guess I'll have to win in a while. Uh, the Soviet government regularly uh, leveled uh, these charges, and today within China, you're probably aware uh, the Chinese government in Beijing regularly denounces uh, Tibetan Lamaism and Uyghur Islam. Um, I lived in Poland uh, during the years of Solidarność, 1980 81, during the Soviet. Uh, control of yours. Um, and at the time, there was little question that the one person who could speak with the surest voice for the entire, um, before the entire Polish people uh, was Cardinal Wyszynski. And he always insisted that the ruling political elite were merely Russian puppets. To demonstrate his strength, and conversely, the illegitimacy of the Communist Party, which officially frowned on religious participation. The Cardinal traveled widely about the country, announcing in advance the city and cathedral at which he would be officiating its services the following Sunday. For a time, the head of the Communist government was foolish enough to challenge the popularity of the Cardinal by announcing beforehand his Sunday appearance in a different city. It really was never much of a contest. No cathedral was large enough to contain the massive crowds attracted by the cardinal, and loudspeakers were necessary to bring his voice to the masses in the street. And even without the presence of the cardinal, attendance at church services throughout those years was very, very, very impressively high. Substantial changes in his portrait took place, however, almost immediately after 1990. Attendance at church fell precipitously, and a government survey in 1991 disclosed that the army, not the church, was clearly the favorite institution in Poland. 
there must have been even much more going to the church leaders, was when asked, what institution do you most trust? The church, with only a 31% vote, was even beaten out by the militia of the police, with 34% who a few, few years earlier, I can assure you, were despised as enemies of the people. A similar drop in church attendance in Serbia, Croatia, and Slovenia occurred almost immediately following the deconstruction of Yugoslavia. I welcome any additional suggestions as to how we can separate nationalism and religion for analytical purposes. I regularly tell my students, if we're to make any real headway, in our understanding in these areas of identity, what we desperately need is not just necessarily more research, more of the same, but new imaginative approaches to research. But anyway, to recapitulate, the Islamic revival and a number of other contemporary religio-political movements, though generally viewed as separate from and overriding national considerations, often have a significant even paramount ethno-national dimension. While trends suggest that religion will certainly play a significant role over the long term, this should not be necessarily construed as in any way limiting the influence of ethno-nationalism. There is no natural competition between the two. To the degree that religion grows in influence, it is apt to serve as a reinforcer rather than as an opponent of national aspirations. But both religion and ethno-nationalism, separate and in conjunction, should prove to be major forces well, to in the, well into the future. But because they are so intermeshed, analysts will continue to be frustrated in trying to sort out the wellsprings of movements in terms of their religious or national roots. The British authorities in Cyprus in the post-World War II period were particularly frustrated by this admixture. Archbishop Macarius was the religious leader of the island's Greek community, and he was also the principal architect of the campaign to drive the British out. A story circulating in British intelligence at the time held that the archbishop had two boxes on the front corners of his desk, one marked sacred, the other top sacred. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 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 You want it? Yeah. Yeah. The, the floor's not open for questions, and then you've got a wide range of topics. People come out of chairs and screaming. Please don't be shy. Well, you spoke about the, the Islamic revival and being a response, if I understood correctly, to, um, to a failed secular Arab, failed Arab secular government. Do you see any, looking, looking around the world in Europe, do you see a, a Christian revival in response to, to secular government uh, in, in, in Europe? This is the case where I so need uh, the person who was supposed to be my colleague during term before he had to rush to the hospital because um, there's so many things that are occurring that seem, at least on the surface, to, to a layman as being contradictory. I mean, for example, as people, as I indicated in that poll, but we have many more recent polls, Ask them if they're religious, and they will tell you they are. The numbers, even throughout Europe, are very, very significant. Ask them if they engage in ritual, if they attend services, and so forth. Uh, and that's been down everywhere. Now, again, these are not, I mean, somebody else is in the area of religion is going to have to translate this into, into what it means. I mean, I'm a bit afraid to tackle it. It's simply because I'm a novice. Uh, and I have pros near me. I'm, I'm a novice when it comes to all, all the different meanings of religion, because that alone, I, I talked about what is a nation. I mean, if is a, Larry had planned a lecture uh, on um, the various meanings of religion within a socio-economic context.
So I, I, I think I'll dodge it. I, 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 don't, I couldn't give a decent answer anyway, frankly. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I find what you've given us today uh, extremely helpful and uh, uh, basis for uh, what I hope to be fruitful uh, work in the future. And I, I can think of numerous instances out of my own experience that corroborate exactly what you're talking about. The uh, tendency to nationalize or emphasize a religion uh, and is an instance of the tendency to appropriate the stature of powerful belief systems and rituals for other purposes. And I can think of instances where that's true within a religion. For example, in, within Christianity, there are several movements like the Christian socialists or the fascists or others who have attempted to appropriate for their own purposes uh, Jesus and Christianity as they are the true version of Christianity and so forth. And this, this goes on all the time. I guess my question is, though, how do you disaggregate all of that? How do you pull, it, how do you pull all of that apart? How do you figure out what's the cause and what's the effect? What's, what's feeding on, on each other? Because by the same token, there is also, uh, I have a sense in which beliefs are true, are, are, it's not just Marxist superstructure. It's not just the idea that uh, it's, it's some ideology. People really do die for their beliefs. And so how do you, how do you pull all of that out, you know, pull that asunder and figure out what's really going on here? Is it nationalism, ethnicity, or is it religion, or is it some kind of mixture of both that you can never pull out, out, out you know, apart? Yeah, I, I'm not, again, dodging. The only person, the people who will do this have to know that society, they have to know the language, they have to know the culture, um, and they have to have at their fingertips, I believe more than ever before, maybe new types, maybe more intelligent types, but they need new ways of questioning people on a, on a large scale, not just what do you think of, and the words are almost put in your mouth, but drawing out, those require tremendous in-depth interviews and a tremendous effort. I mean, this is the sort of thing you'd have to have foundation support to even consider. And then you'd be sitting around figuring, how do we staff this? With what type? Certainly not political scientists, by and large. I mean, I would want sociologists, I'd want anthropologists who are, particularly the anthropologists who's uh, in a, um, if we're dealing with a, uh, an area outside of Europe and North America where their specialization in, in learning about societies and learning how to tap their attitudes and all is essential. It will be a mixture and it will vary from person to person again. That's why it's going to be so difficult. This is, this is terribly subtle stuff. It's not either or. It's not going to come out like the typical opinion poll does in the United States. It's, it's going to be a very, very difficult job and it's, it's going to require great minds and great money and a great effort and great youth. I don't have any of those things. <laughs> right. uh, sorry. I, I, actually there was a question back there. Oh uh, please. Actually I wanted to make a comment in response to the earlier question. Uh, I think the Rukin situation is quite fascinating for a number of reasons. I think the European situation is fascinating for a number of reasons. Now. And one of them is the new immigrants in Europe. Uh, because to some extent, they are the ones who may feel the need uh, to challenge the secularism of Europe. Um, the old Europe, not to pick up on that, uh, <laughs> uh, but the old Europe has a different cultural and historical memory about religion. Uh, to the extent that most think that they are post-Christian, uh, they're much more nervous about reclaiming uh, that heritage. But the new immigrants have a different sensibility. And so the real challenge will be how that gets negotiated within the current context of European identity. Uh, yeah, I, you, you made 
make a distinction between religions uh, restricted to a single people, you name Judaism and Sikhism, and versus universal religions, uh, such as Christianity. And I wanted to ask you to maybe say a bit about where Orthodox Christianity fits into that typology. Well, what I was suggesting, I think a little beyond that, is I read it, um, you know, we use some of the expressions used, tribal religions. Uh, what I'm suggesting is all religions tend to become tribalized, tend to become ethnicized, tend to become nationalized. Um, so, I, I mean, I suppose I would say that's true you know, across the board, because I, again, I, I mean, I realize I'm standing on the shoulders of some fabulous scholars, including, um, oh my God, Stanley Tambia, who's going to be here as one of our speakers, who is, he knows more and has written more about the uh, how ethnic, literally how ethnic state and religious identities come together throughout the whole Theravada Buddhist world than any living human being. But so I'm standing even on his shoulders, obviously, when I say that there too, I mean, it's the same sort of thing, that Buddhism, again, became tribalized, if you will, it became Thai, it became Burman. It didn't become, it didn't become, uh, it, it didn't become the state of Burma wide, it became Burman, it became ethnically Burman on the part of the Burmans. It, it was another group taken, all this to a degree, I don't know, I'm feeling my way here and I don't want to go way overboard, but I mean, think about it, uh, whatever, whatever the, the divine uh, creature, whatever, to whom you're referring, you talk to him, pray to him in a given language, you pray to him and see him with the images that come from your own experience. I mean, many people in the years ago, I have a lot of great quotes, people insisting, you know, God was a German, for example. Uh, and, uh, but at another level, what I'm suggesting, <laughs> Well, what I'm suggesting is it's not so surprising. Uh, I, I got a hunch I wouldn't have to go into too many homes in Western Ireland <laughs> to find an elderly woman who would say, of course. I mean, if I just added Irish rather than German. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but can you say a little bit about um, the connection between Orthodox Christianity and imminent statehood? It seems to me that you have to have an imminent state or a state to be recognized as a separate church. Is, is, is that or is that not the case? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not. You know, it's probably true in the sense that you need to be a political force. Uh, when, when you... See, I really hate to hit and... Uh, no, I, I just want to stick with That's okay. Um, yeah. Other people have tried. And even people, once they get their state, have typically very often... Uh, gone to the patriarch and said, we would not like our, and then the battle begins. Uh, the patriarch of Moscow, you've been formally under us, we don't want to give it up, well then fine, then we're going to number one down in Istanbul or Constantinople, as it would still be maintained by the Orthodox religion. Uh, and this sort of thing goes on, and there's real hard-nosed politics, and it's pure in many cases, the ethnic nationalism is so powerful, even the statements back and forth, because they're charging one another with all sorts of things. And um, again, because similar to this, it's what I suggested with regard to uh, um, finally having a pope take the first step towards the beatification, the sainthood of a, a person from your country. This is one huge battle that goes on. I've got uh, this term, uh, students in class that be reading a wonderful uh, account by a Croatian of how, uh, why they felt you know, we really need this sort of thing. Uh, in Mexico, is there are Mexi Mexican nationals here, I'm gonna have to apologize for a start because it, it sounds like I'm making fun of it or criticizing which I certainly am not. But when, when um, I gave you, you know, the legend of, of uh, uh, 
the Lady of Guadalupe? Well, there's a very strong question whether the peasant that she supposedly went to ever even lived. There's a good reason to believe that this is a piece of, of very, not mischievous history, but fallacious history. There's, there's so much goes into the chronology and you have to read the arguments back and forth. On, but at any rate, you know, into the storm came the Pope, and as you probably recently know, just said, yes, we are recognizing this as a true miracle. Definitely, Our Lady of Guadalupe was a true um, apparition of uh, the God of Jesus. Their argument in part was Mexico doesn't have such a person. We, the Mexican people need this. The Croatian people need this. So the, the battles are really fought along ethnic lines within these universal religions. Uh, and, and certainly, again, I mean, is, well, well, your, your good husband tell you a lot more about, about some of the events that occurred about 10 years ago um, is between um, the Baltic republics who were seeking uh, this, and again, the, the primate in Moscow, who just, I mean, made this pure and simple. I mean, you, you want this just along ethnic grounds. Nobody should ask, and yet he's defending it as a Russian. So it, it goes it goes in circles, so it's very hard. Well, I, I, well, I've been promising the other care for about an hour. But, <laughs> um, well, you started out by saying that this was recycled material, but the brilliance of recycled material is that if you haven't used it before or heard it before, oh, it's perfectly useful. Hey, hey, come on, we started moving off that. <laughs> um, I just want to kind of explore or ask you to think through a sort of tension I see in, in your argument, because you, you kind of finish by saying, um, religion and nation are reinforcers and they're intertwined and it's hard to separate them and they work together. In many cases, yeah. In many cases. And the implication of that is, in some sense, they're, they're equally important phenomena for understanding how people use, how people identify with the political world around them and act in that world. But, but I think almost all, if not absolutely all of the examples you gave, or actually examples where a nation trumps religion. I told you the end, I was picking them purposely for that. I mean, I mean, I'll give you, I mean, right off the top of my head, I'll give you a counter illustration if you want. <laughs> well, I guess it's not so much a counter illustration, but, but your sense after, after reviewing um, the, the two sides of is it, is it really the case that in most cases, nation trumps religion or is the predominant factor? Is it, was that the case 100 years ago, but it's very different from the last 10, 20, or 30 years, and now it's equal? Or has the balance tilted historically towards religion being the more important element of that equation? How do you view the, the trajectory of history as a balance huge. of importance in those two factors? Excellent question. Huge. And, you know, I mean, it's so massive, I wouldn't know quite what I'd have come up, but I, I've got to answer, try to answer part of it. Um, what we can say kind of years ago. One important element is, and there's so many variables here, I'm not trying to reduce this to simplicity, and one of the most important variables is, is there a strong national consciousness there that we're talking about anyway? And very often, we presume where it's not. Now, for example, I was very careful when I was talking about that huge poll on the Arabs that this was simply the select literati who are responding to it, although it's the biggest sample we've ever had in the Arab world. Uh, that group does tend to be tremendously uh, consciousness of an, of, an, and of an Arab consciousness, and it means a lot to them. But you know, throughout a great deal of the world, I, I said today to somebody, I said, I'm not trying to uh, in any way draw a causal line between this and Islam. But particularly, it seems to me off the top of my head, within Islam, uh, many of the people are still in a somewhat pre-nationalist situation in that as the clans, tribes, are still the primary pole of loyalty. You remember, for example, when the US went into Somalia, one of the stated reasons of the Intelligence Committee of Community for picking Somalia was it was, quote, one of the most homogeneous of all the African states. After all, over 
odd percent civilian. And then, of course, the American troops got in there. And they say, there's the enemy, and they're being shot by three different groups from over here and so forth. They had no idea. We had no idea what was going on in there for some time until finally uh, somebody decided to take a book by an extremely fine London-based uh, anthropologist who had worked in Somalia for practically all his life, who pointed out the Klan is still where it ends. And he walked down and he pointed out how, in the book, and before all this happened, and he pointed out how in each one of the clans there is a, a person of truly remarkable memory who is in fact given the job of uh, of actually record, uh, of being able to articulate the, uh, the entire genetic origin 16 generations back. Now you start with your mother and father and those 16 generations give you an idea of what a memory this would require. But the point being, that's where it ended. Our clan is distinct from that clan as much as, except for skin pigmentation, as we would be with any European that came in, including the Americans. Uh, so again, I mean, this is this is a fact. It's such a fact within Iraq uh, that nobody knows how to write that place up because, again, tribe. It's it's not just. I mean, it's easy to say Shiite and Sunni. But then once you get below that, you start finding that it's following tribal pattern and a clan patterns within that. Clans are extremely strong within that part of the world, extremely strong within the Yemen, extremely strong within Afghanistan. It's easy to speak of the Pushtuns, and they have to be my favorite people since I, 100 years ago, I wrote a master's thesis on them. Um, but they're, they, it's one thing to talk about the Christian people, and on one level they're aware of it. At another level, this is clan and tribe, and then only then do you start thinking of yourself as a Pushtun or Pakhtun. And normally, open warfare exists between them. Now, does this play out at the present time in Waziristan, where U.S. troops and Pakistanis have no control? You bet it does. This is not a push tune. It'd be too simple to say this is a push tune thing. It's a Waziri thing. They've got the Waziris are committed to their leader that they will stick with this, you know, until he says no. Uh, so again, see, a hundred years ago, then we're back asking, well, what kind of identification did we have? And in one of the countries you know so much more about than I do, France, as you well know. The question of French identity in the 19th century was very seriously questioned by uh, Allison's friend who was here last year in perhaps one of the most mind mind brilliant books ever written, Peasants into Frenchmen, uh, 1870 to 1914. Um, in it, I, I mean, it, so again, what would we be talking about? We would be talking Frenchmen for many, for most were all French in 1870. They would be talking valley, village, something much, much smaller. So these things change when people talk about, uh, but at one time, religion was the paramount thing, going back to the wars of religion of the 16th, uh, early 17th century. I, um, yeah, no question. Uh, but whose religion? The religion, of course, of the prince and so forth on, in most of this. But how strong is the religious identity? I have no idea. I do know that whenever I run across any data anywhere, as in Ireland, it's supposed to be, quote, priest ridden. Um, one of my Irish friends uh, turned that around a little bit. You may remember that a uh, bishop um, admitted a few years back he gave birth to a child, to a young woman, who he then sent to the United States. My friend said, he was proud of it, he said, this gives um, the Irish uh, that tradition of being priesthood in a whole new dimension. <laughs> uh, whatever. And anyhow, it, these things, um, it, it, at that time, in well into the, towards the, this, the, 
the third quarter of the 19th century, attendance at churches supposedly mandatory, extremely low in Ireland, in a rural Ireland, practically nothing. So again, it's, I, I hate to go jumping to deep because everybody, it's easy to generalize. Then I find that when I jump in, I never find the picture that I thought was there when I jumped in. It's a mess. So I, I'm not trying to... Thank you, uh, Welcome very much for your comments today, and uh, thank you and Larry Arbor for organizing a splendid series of lectures that I look forward to hearing plenty of them. I have a suggestion for you, one more item to put on the research agenda may be worth looking at. You alluded to briefly today of the case of nationalism tribalizing religion, and that's what's going on in Indonesia today. You mentioned before, it's overwhelmingly Muslim, 200 people, but in some areas, the Obama uh, There's some polities and other definitely non-Islamic uh, characteristics. But when you look even more closely, more recently, you see even more local ethno-linguistic nationalist sentiment arising. For example, there were elections. There have been a couple of elections in the past five years. And the number of, quote, Islamic parties is proliferating. Uh, and all very locally based. And one of the big issues they're contending is they want uh, instruction in public schools in the elementary grades to be in the local language. And they're all contending against each other, trying to get their local ethno-linguistic national identity on, on the statute. Can you just answer that one? I found someone like you, and then a little longer goes my thoughts about that country. <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank you for a wonderful thank you.